Hi, this is Paul. A little bit of mop-up on the Tuesday video. I really debated the title of this video. Um, I was originally thinking about the rise and fall of the IDW, but because, well, did Peterson fall? And I noticed some chatter in the comment section about that. And so I wanted to talk about that because it's along the lines of my thinking about eschatology what is eschatology? Eschatology is a fancy Christian theological word for sort of the sum of our hopes, what we shoot for, what we direct. Um, is our aim true and what is our aim after? So I, I didn't I don't I, I didn't really give it that title for clickbait. I gave it that title um, in earnestness, I'd say. Because, well, isn't Jordan still active? Isn't he still selling lots of books, having conversations, doing interviews? Yeah. Um, you don't rise again unless at some point you fell, stumbled, failed, lost momentum. Uh, you look at a lot of interesting careers like Winston Churchill. And, you know, after Gallipoli, Churchill looked done. But, of course, he had his rise then during the Second World War and then decline after that. In terms of how we play, at the moment, we rise and fall. That's what happens. Sometimes people are hot, sometimes people aren't. Um, George Bush Sr. talked about Big Mo and his election's momentum. Um, Jordan Peterson lost a lot of momentum in his time away, and I think also on his book tour. But I, I want to do some more. There, there was a moment in, I, th I think probably peak Jordan Peterson was January 2018 when his new book came out, the Kathy Newman interview, although someone left a comment which had some, which did some looking at the metrics of the GQ interview and made a, made a point that the GQ interview with Peterson has a lot more views than even the Kathy Newman interview, which is interesting. Of course, Peterson's always looking at metrics for these kinds of things. Um, I remember at that point, I know I'm going to mention this, and some of you are going to think I'm thinking about you, but there are actually a number of people who would say things like, do you think he could save Western civilization? And, and right there in that phrase, there's a sense of, okay, save it from what? Save it for what? That, that entire phrase, anytime we use this word save, we, we use it eschatologically. Um, if you're drowning in the ocean, you're saved by being hauled out and brought back onto dry land. Um, Protestantism has, has made use of, you know, the New Testament word, um, you know, he got saved, she got saved, but the New Testament usage of that word is a, is a big fat one with a broad um, contextual range. Don't you remember that moment when you thought that this guy was going to take down and take out the corrupt entrenched powers and restore whatever it is that you thought the West should be? Um, there was an eschatological dream that went unfulfilled for his fan base. And, you know, many people experienced the Jordan Peterson whoosh where you did a deep dive into his videos. And, and that moment was transformative. Now, we have transformative moments, but the evaluation of those moments should always be the degree to which it lasts. I think about that Dan Fogelberg's, Fogelberg song. I'm dating myself with music, of course. Um, Why Can't We Make Love Stay? Or Jim Croce, um, If I Could Put Time in a Bottle. We have these Kairos moments where we... An, an eschatological hope wells up in us, but does it last? Can it endure? Does the age of decay sort of creep up and take things away from us? Now, it's a lot easier to see with the rest of the IDW gang. Um, you know, Joe Rogan keeps doing what he's always been doing. He's on Spotify, which I'm... <laughs> I don't use Spotify much, and I know people have asked if I can get my podcast onto Spotify, and I have to go back and basically delete all sorts of conversational podcasts that 
uh, weren't recorded in MP3, and then I can just port Podbeam over to Spotify, and I'll do that at some point. But, you know, Joe Rogan is just kind of out there. Joe Rogan, Ben Shapiro was never really part of the IDW. Why? Because the IDW was really a splinter of the left, as, as David Fuller said. Ben Shapiro was sort of the token conservative in the bunch, but Ben Shapiro, what does Ben Shapiro play on TV? Um, Eric Weinstein gave up his portal, and we'll talk a little bit more about Eric later. But yeah, he's the one who coined the IDW and, um, you know, to a certain degree killed it, both created it and killed it once he coined it. Sam Harris remains sort of a quirky, um, a quirky sort of grumpy loner, um, you know, not able to maintain it seems, stable relationships with the rest of the members. Dave Rubin went full Dennis Prager, and so, you know, basically defected from the left. So so in many ways, the heart of the IDW remains sort of Joe Rogan, Eric, and Brett Weinstein, and maybe um, Shermer to a degree. And, and I, think, I think Brett and Heather are, you know, in, in many ways sort of the leftovers and the true believers of it. His his Unity 2020 attempt, which most of us saw as, you know, pretty pie in the sky, idealistic. I mean he's Brett Wine Breton, I don't know to what degree Heather is too. I she just strikes me as a um she she's she's sort of one of the underrated members of the team, I think. But um, you know, when I listen to them, I'm often impressed by her balance and her quality. But he's the he's the He's the starry-eyed true believer of the bunch, um, the, the kid who who won't give up on the dream. He's in some ways the, the Scotty Pimp, Pippen to Jordan Peterson's Michael Jordan on that team. And he keeps where they keep working hard at it. They keep putting out their their dark horse podcasts and they get defunded from YouTube and you know they're fighting the COVID fights and on and on and on and on. But there's there's no whoosh there. Um they don't have any of the transformative power that Jordan Peterson had in terms of in terms of individuals. And Jordan Peterson is the Superman to the IDW Justice League. He he continues to be. I think he always was. The rest were mostly role players compared to his rising star and the degree to which he was able to catalyze and marshal that whoosh that happened in 2018. The rest rode with him. Um, he had he had a breadth given by his religious openness and the potential, while the rest of the team usually felt sort of constrained and locked in. And when he went down, the rest of the team just simply couldn't carry the game. Now, there's a variety of comments um, that, well, David Fuller is, is bitter because he was locked out by Peterson, Inc. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. David doesn't seem like the bitter type to me. David... You know, a lot of times people would say things like Jordan Peterson is a shell and not uh, or a sellout um, or a grifter. And and again, important Jordan Peterson, you know, collected his paycheck. But I think at the heart of Jordan is a guy who genuinely cares for people. That was brought up in the comment section, too, where you get that real sense from Peterson that he does care about the individuals and he is willing to put his money and especially his time where his mouth is again i've mentioned many times the way he can work that vip line was truly an amazing thing so so david um, I, I don't see david as bitter he knows the industry with um, he knows the blue church media industry well and i i don't get a sense that he's cynical at all in this david too is sort of a a uh, true believer, always hopeful. And so he's, you know, he's doing the best he can with rebel wisdom, seeking truth. Um, and and I, I don't think he finds rest until, until he finds heaven. Andrea is another interesting individual. She, you know, I, after the Bridges of Meaning Discord and then did a couple of interviews with me, with, with me, she reminded me that she had written me a, an email very early in the, time of my channel and I hadn't remembered I'd gotten a lot of emails especially early 
And I had written back, you know, especially in those early days when the channel was quite a bit smaller, I really, people came to me with basically their individual stories, and that sort of was the beginning of the Randos conversation, and so I responded to her questions about Christianity. But in a lot of ways, Andrea sort of nicely typifies, I think, a lot of the audience that we we're, we're, saw something in Jordan and were swept up. And, and part of why she sort of nicely typifies it is because she is a woman and and that's a little bit atypical but she yeah i think and and watching her in these interviews you can hear her passion and her, her desire for having the things in her faith worked out um, in, in some ways she's sort of a classic example of someone who was like many of you, like many of the conversations I've had, sort of on the cusp of deconstructing, but not wanting to go there and saw in Peterson a window and an opportunity to have her faith life not fully divorced from the public world. And but then with the with the fall of Jordan, you know, where to go? Now, I think in some ways, the Bridges of Meaning community um, helped people find people like Justin Brierley, uh, David Fuller, who I think, again, are more are more true believers. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, maybe in an Eric Hoffa sense a little bit, but they're more true believers. These are people who are high in openness, um, very much holding on to faith. It's part of their personality matrix. Now, some like like Justin Brierley, you know, continue with Christianity. And like myself, others like David Fuller, that big swath of people who had some Christianity in their path. But I know David in a number of places, when he saw Jordan, wondered, is there, is, is there, is there something, can Christianity rise again? And, you know, sort of when he, Peterson didn't hit the mark, David has sort of gone out looking for other things. And in many ways, Rebel Wisdom is an expression of him and his community going out and looking for other things. Now, again, as a Christian, I don't think he'll find it. I don't think he'll find it in integral theory. I don't think he'll find it in Smacked in Burger or in Plan B or in... So, so Rebel Wisdom in that way sort of cycles through you know, it's it in some ways expresses David's living out the YouTube anthem. I still haven't found what I'm looking for, but he's looking and he's not going to stop looking until his soul finds rest. And of course, I'm quoting Augustine there. So, you know, I, Andrea's journey, <laughs> Andrea says, if she if she moved to Sacramento, she would join my church. Um fairly regularly have people who wander in here from my channel and they kind of look around and wonder, is this what's behind this YouTuber? And I always joke with people about authenticity that uh, Living Stones has more authenticity than a good than most people really care for. It truly does. So her journey is tracking, not wanting to deconstruct, sort of orthodoxy curious. I mean, many in the Bridges of Meaning Discord server have, you know, been in the process of joining the Orthodox Church. But Andrea, not yet. I mean, she's got a husband and some boys. And one of the things that, that has to happen is your, your church life, especially if you're married and with a family and you sort of want that to go together, you've got to sort of keep all of those things in mind. So... Um, you know, looking for some hope, but sort of foggy on how and what. Eschatolo eschatology is a foggy business. It's always present implicitly. It, it draws us intuitively. Most of the time, we're sort of dead reckoning, rough drafting, doing A-B comparisons with it. And, and in, in a lot of ways, that's that's humanity's lot to, to work on those things. But it, it draws us and... You can, you can see its pull, even with 
a, a hard-bitten atheist like Sam Harris. Sam Harris is still longing for something. Uh, Brett Weinstein is still longing for something. And to the degree that they are disillusioned by Blue Church, or at least the direction that Blue Church has gone in terms of seeking social justice and the end of the patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, they're, they're, they're on eschatological missions. Now, Eric, in terms of his public profile, who knows what goes on in private, you know, is he in or out? Is he flaking? Is he floating? Is he looking for FU money? You know, the portal was, in, in some ways, you know, showed some vibrancy. I thought, you know, some of his conversations were quite authentic and open, um, but he gave it up. Okay, now what? There's a lot of giving things up, and it doesn't mean that he's giving up, but um, we just we just have no idea. And as sort of the coiner and exposer of the IDW, he's got an important part to play. But again, you know, maybe he's the uh, you know if 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 his brother Brett is Scotty Pippen, he's the um, oh I can't think of his name right now. Is Eric Weinstein the Dennis Rodman of the Bulls? Brett is the Scottie Pippen. Jordan's the Michael, or <laughs> Jordan Peterson's the Michael Jordan. Um, Eric is Dennis Rodman, maybe. You know, he's been he's been keying on the decadence thing, but it's unclear if he's down with the mission or just in it for himself. Uh, he'd be offended by a, a statement like that because he likes to likes to come off as the most earnest guy there, but and then he kind of chides his his brother Brett for, you know, him and Heather teaching at that hippie true believer school and then getting kicked out of it instead of climbing the Ivy Leagues while Eric is the guy who keeps decrying the corruption of of the academy. So yeah, Dennis Rodman. Uh Brett's the true believer. David mentioned the Stoa and Eric Wisdom and Rebel Wisdom, and they're sort of of a pair. You know, looking at the logo, I had to grab the logo from Rebel Wisdom's thumbnail on top of their YouTube site, and you know, very much ancient, modern, urban aesthetic. You know, working on sort of an eschatological subplot of the contemporary youth culture, or at least millennial culture. And they're both sort of running non-ecclesiastical labs, trying to approximate a congregation without a tradition. I thought David Fuller's comment on Jonathan Peugeot's comment on a a fan base is not a congregation. I, I think in many ways, Stoa and Rebel Wisdom are are trying to trying to found a church, but wanting to steer clear of church tradition. Um, I just don't know how long such things last. Jordan Peterson rose in the Donald Trump moment, and that's there are many, many connections there. Figuring out all the connections between them isn't easy, but both Donald Trump and Jordan figured out how to expose the lies of Blue Church that were increasingly feeling corrupt and ineffective. Uh, Blue Church's spray tan was showing. But Trump's weakness exposed conservatism's weakness, which was, okay, double down on your base. Um, it's not enough. And Jordan Peterson's point on the Bill Marshall, what are you going to do with the other half of the half of the population? You know, what's going to go on? Conservatism only wins when they not only expose the vacuity of the new thing, but they convince the big five openness crowd that they have a way forward. And, and Peterson managed to do that. The way he both rallied conservatives and at least disaffected liberals and inspired them, I think that in many ways was the key to the eschatological hope of the Peterson whoosh and, and, and the way he rode the w wave in 2018. And, well, of course, I'm a Christian minister, so it comes as no surprise where I look for answers. But 
how, how can you have be all how can you be both conservative how can you be conservative progressive and eschatological and i think the reason that we see this in the west and we have this mixture of all of it in the west is because of christianity um, part of christianity's success is how at times it manages to tie together the creative god the creator god which is ancient original it has it brings that energy and power to it a stable moral ethic C.S. Lewis talked about in the, the abolition of man, the Tao. This is, of course, why I think the woke will not inherit the earth. It, it's, it, their, their moral ethic will simply not scale or be stable. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just not going to work. A vision of progress towards the sum of our joys. Christianity manages to, to hold all of those things together, but... Because holding all of those things together is so very difficult, Christians have a hard time with it, and the church often fails at it. It manages both hierarchy and equality. Um, Christianity, both Christianity, the ancient world assumed hierarchy. That was fairly easy to see. Christianity brought equality into the mix, and and that's what if you read the Gospels with this interplay between, it's an interplay, of course, between heaven and earth, but this interplay between equality and hierarchy, nobody does that like Jesus. On, on one hand, he says at the end of the book of, of Matthew, all things in heaven and earth have been given to me. Well, that's about as radical a hierarchy as you're going to find. He's also the one who says he's the servant of all. And so as Peugeot says, he fills up the hierarchy, and in filling up the hierarchy creates this this radical equality, and it all holds together in him. And, and I think because Jordan managed to, Jordan leveraged some of that power from Christianity in, in a way that, that wasn't decadent like, like so much church decadence encumbers it. And, and so he was, he was flirting with the Western core. Which is, which is why the biblical series was, was so vital, I think. I think Tom Holland in his episode on the culture war really nailed it. When, when for Tom Holland, talking to Dominic Sandbrook, culture war happens when you have, when it's basically a Christendom civil war, when, when hierarchy and equality are fighting, when progress is at odds with conservatism and and, and what happens in those wars are you're working out the tensions and upping the resolutions on the applications of these things. Now, both are grounded in different emphases within the Christian vision. Progressives um, long for progress. Conservatives long for a permanent home grounded in history. And again, in Christianity, you're, you're able to get both, but, but figuring out how to live that out well, there's, there's where the fight and there's where the tension is. And, and so, of course, I believe that working, working Christianity is the only way forward. Now, none of us know the future of Dr. Peterson, uh, how far or fast he can recover. Um, there's reasons to believe there's, there's a map territory aspect to Jordan's effect. And if that's true, you know, he had his moment. The man and the moment found each other. He, he, he rose high, but... He'll sort of fade like many others have faded. Uh, we'll see. But, but we're no judge of history. We, we can't know and we can't tell. And ultimately, it's not really about him. None of us can see the future assessment of him. So, so what do you do? Well, you keep doing the work and, in my opinion, leave the outcomes to the hand of God. You know, you speak the truth. You don't worry about tomorrow. The pagans chase after these things. You seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and Christ's righteousness. Well, what does that mean? I think part of it means managing the hierarchy and the equality, managing the conservatism and the progressivism. And, and it's not about you. Um, he eventually hands over the kingdom to the Father. Um, and when, when he is all in all, Read through, again, the book of Colossians. It's a short book, but if you've been listening to my talk about principalities and powers, it's, it's, it's very re revelatory. 
Well, that's, I don't know how short this video is. I don't know when I'll post it, but just reading some of the comments, that's sort of what struck me and sort of what I wanted to say.